Have you ever heard a story you immediately thought should be a movie? I bet you have. This is one of those. One day, a few hours in this dude's life could be one of the most intense war movies ever. On this episode of Vestiges of History, let's slip back into the jungles of Vietnam or maybe Laos or maybe Cambodia and meet Lieutenant Colonel Frederick J.G. Caristo, Mac V. Sog. This is an episode of firsts. The first Mac V. Sog episode, the first historic hoodie episode. Yeah. That's right, it's a hoodie guaranteed to have never been stolen by your girlfriend. This hoodie dates from the late 1960s to the early 1970s. It is missing its label, but it is a size small. And before you think it, no, I did not try it on. The outer shell is a woven cotton blend, while the inner lining is a cotton mesh. On the front right breast, we see the last name Caristo, in the style of Vietnamese machine embroidery, popular during the Vietnam War. On the back of the hoodie, we see a personalization, a hand screen printed and painted version of the insignia for the Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observations Group, featuring a skull, jaws agape, dripping blood from its sharpened teeth, wearing a green beret superimposed on a shell burst. The scroll we see with the CNC stands for Command and Control. Beneath the scroll is screen printed the jarring slogan, Kill a Kong for Christ. This statement was popular during the Cold War, like Kill a Kami for Mommy. This is a statement of the era, the mindset of the people in that era, and the dark humor that has been endemic in the military since man first picked up a rock against another man. However one might find this slogan today, this is simply an example of the ideological turbulence of the 1960s. Lastly, I must thank Bob Chat of Vintage Productions who loaned me this vestige several months ago to tell this story. Bob is a legend in the vintage clothing and military collectibles worlds and I am fortunate to call him a friend and a supporter of this channel. I would also like to thank Jason Hardy, SOG historian and author, for supporting this episode and sharing what he knew about Caristo and artifacts from his collection. Now we can start pulling threads. Little is known about Caristo in general, especially his youth. We know that he was born in Boston, Massachusetts on 8 December 1939 to second generation Italian American parents. He distinguished himself at Boston University in the ROTC program, graduating in June of 1962 and receiving a commission as a second lieutenant in the Army. Details of Caristo are murky, but I am fortunate to have 18 pages of a very redacted but nonetheless informative 211 file, courtesy of the National Archives and Records Administration via collector Ryan Akins. Thank you, Ryan. From this file, we know that Caristo enlisted at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and attended the U.S. Infantry School, and took the following courses there. Infantry Officer, Airborne, Jump Master, Special Weapons, and the Ranger Course, and Air Delivery, which sounds kind of out of place but will come in handy later. He served as Platoon Leader and Company Commander of Company E, 3rd Battalion, 187th Infantry Regiment, Airborne. Afterwards, he received training in jungle operations, special warfare counterinsurgency, and the Vietnamese language at the Defense Language Institute. In February of 1965, he was assigned as an advisor to the 37th Vietnamese Ranger Battalion, the Biet Don Quan, or BDQ, to get his platoon time out of the way. He later became the psychological warfare instructor at BDQ High Command. In June of 1966, he was transferred to Studies and Observations Group then called counterintelligence. He would be attached to SOG until March of 1968. Remember when I told you that just one day in this dude's life could be a movie? That day was Christmas Eve 1966 in Cambodia, where Lieutenant Caristo participated in a POW rescue mission. A 
Major Caristo distinguished himself by extraordinary heroism on the 24th of December 1966, while a member of the Studies and Observations Group, Headquarters, Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. Major Caristo's mission was to accompany an extremely dangerous and sensitive United States prisoner recovery mission in the Batu area of Cambodia, distinguish the Cambodians from the North Vietnamese, and act as an interpreter during any ground negotiations. He was also charged with the security and maximum exploitation of the North Vietnamese Hoi Chan, military defector, who would accompany the operation. The Hoi Chan had provided the initial intelligence which prompted the operation and had revealed two United States prisoners were being held in an isolated hamlet near Ba Tu. The objective area was secured by a reinforced North Vietnamese battalion surrounded by several minefields and contained numerous armed explosive manufacturing shops and caches. The prisoners were being held in a hut bordered on three sides by minefields. Initial planning called for a nap of the earth hellebore assault inside the minefield next to the prisoner's hut. At 1200 hours, the 24th of December, 1966, the helicopters made their final approach. With Major Caristo aboard, the lead helicopter began inserting on the wrong side of the minefield. Major Caristo immediately exited the lead helicopter and simultaneously the supporting gunships began their suppression fires into the minefield and surrounding area. The lead helicopter pilot, realizing his navigational error, left the landing zone and attempted to insert the assault troops on the opposite side of the minefield. After their initial surprise, the North Vietnamese defenders rallied and began to place intensive protective fires throughout the area. Major Caristo, realizing the danger to the prisoners, the possibility of their execution, and the fact that he was the only assault troop on the ground, began to move toward the prisoner's hut. With complete disregard for his own safety and realizing the extreme danger, Major Caristo ran 50 meters through the minefield and fusillade of intense, friendly, and enemy fire. He broke through the back wall of the designated hut, captured three occupants, and discovered the prisoners had been moved the previous night. The North Vietnamese unit was offering heavy resistance, and both sides were suffering heavy casualties. The assaulting United States unit had become trapped with a second minefield between them and the North Vietnamese defenders. Major Caristo saw the gravity of the United States troops' precarious situation, took one of his prisoners, and directed the captive to lead him and the assault elements through the minefield, again disregarding his own safety by exposing himself to intense small arms and recoilless weapons fire, Major Caristo began leading the way through the minefield. When the prisoner was killed by small arms fire, Major Caristo demonstrated true leadership and great bravery and continued to lead the way through the minefield. Under an increasing volume of fire, and after knocked to the ground from the blast of a Bangalore torpedo, he successfully led the assault elements through the minefield. This valorous action undoubtedly saved many American lives and allowed the assault to continue. Major Caristo returned to the hamlet to locate the prisoners and encountered a North Vietnamese soldier firing a 57 millimeter recoilless rifle into the rear of the assault elements. Major Caristo fired and wounded the gunner. To obtain further information about the minefields in the area, he captured the wounded gunner. Instead, the prisoner led him to an underground arms explosive shop and attempted to get Major Caristo to enter. Major Caristo wisely had the prisoner enter first. The entrance was booby-trapped and the prisoner was killed. The booby trap also wounded a woman and baby who were occupying the complex. Major Caristo, recognizing the possibility of a second booby trap, crawled into the bunker and pulled the woman and child to safety and medical aid. As the assault unit continued its sweep activities, they discovered a number of bunker complexes. Those United States troops attempting to search the bunkers encountered booby traps and small arms fire, which caused a number of casualties. Reluctant to suffer further casualties, the United States troops began throwing hand grenades into the bunker prior to entering. Major Caristo, realizing there were many women and children in the bunkers, voluntarily entered several of them and saved many civilian lives by assuring the bunker occupants of their safety. 
Major Caristo's command of the Vietnamese and Cambodian languages and their dialects also allowed him to discover 46 North Vietnamese who were attempting to blend in with the Cambodian civilians. Major Caristo additionally provided translations of numerous documents which led to the uncovering of two large arms caches. Through his heroic and unselfish efforts, Major Caristo saved numerous United States military and non-combatant lives. Although the prisoners were not recovered, Major Caristo's valorous actions were the single outstanding factor of the operation and reflect great credit upon him and the United States Army. That Christmas Eve makes Die Hard look like Miracle on 34th Street. The guy ends up on the battlefield alone, has the mind to go mission first, gets into the fight, negotiates the obstacles, gets his guys out, and pulls a Captain Spears and goes back in. This operation was probably only about two hours max, but man was it high speed. It was another day and another op across the fence for the 27-year-old Fred Caristo. I like that at the end, it recognizes that Major Caristo's valorous actions were the single outstanding factor of the operation. And yet, he only received the DSC. That's nothing to snub, of course. But that reads like Medal of Honor material. But you can imagine that politics got in the way with our government needing to maintain a plausible deniability. The CMH has to go before a congressional committee. The CIA naturally wouldn't want a bunch of civilians poking around where they don't belong and telling the media. Now, for those that may not know what MACVSOG was, the Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observations Group was a joint unconventional warfare task force combining the U.S. Army Green Berets, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, the U.S. Marine Corps, and our favorite spook shop, the Central Intelligence Agency, who was beginning to understand its potential and spread its fingers into all the pies. Caristo would go on to participate in Op 34 Alpha as an agent handler, recruiting and training Hoi Chans, who had defected or pretended to defect to the American side to spy against North Vietnam. He was particularly good at this, being fluent in Vietnamese with a working knowledge of Cambodian. Did he speak Vietnamese with a Boston accent? I can only imagine. Military intelligence had discovered that Cambodia was being used to traffic men in arms to attack the southern portion of Vietnam, and cross-border raids in that region were ramped up to shut that door. Caristo was integral in Op 36 Alpha and Bravo, also known as Strata, or the Short-Term Road Watch and Target Acquisition, based out of forward operating base Monkey Mountain in Da Nang. The unit recruited reconnaissance teams comprised of Vietnamese nationals that would be inserted into the DMZ and North Vietnam. These were small Vietnamese recon teams or RTs specializing in prisoner snatching, guerrilla tactics, and targets of opportunity. Op 36A, agent operations in particular, was headquartered at Camp Long Ton's inner compound. The unit was responsible for four separate operations, which I urge you to research on your own, but I may make another video about them at a later date. They are Earth Angel, Cedar Walk, and Pike Hill. These three programs would train indigenous recruits in military intelligence gathering, dress them in either Khmer Rouge or or North Vietnamese Army and VA uniforms and insert them into Laos or Cambodia. The teams or individuals would later be extracted using cached radios or at pre-designated pickup sites and debriefed. The fourth program, the Borden Project, recruited the North Vietnamese Army or NVA prisoners of war, offering them money and citizenship to become collaborators. The U.S. handlers knew these individuals would likely turn once they reinserted into enemy-controlled areas and would load them with deceptive information to get their compatriots to question their loyalty. Yes, it's as dirty as it sounds. In March of 1968, Caristo was transferred to the 149th Military Intelligence Group as Team Chief under the auspices of 5th Special Forces Group Airborne, which worked on collecting human or human intelligence. 
Caristo later became the PRU senior advisor of the Sok Trang province, one of the most active southern provinces. Caristo was with the 149th MiG until the unit rotated back to the U.S. in September of 1969. This is where things get murky, with the use of the word casual appearing in his record of assignments. The term casual meant that Caristo was assigned the unit, but was without an assignment within the unit. He starts attending classes at Fort Holabird, Maryland, and bounces around a bit before returning to Vietnam in March of 1971 as senior advisor for Fung Huang Cords, otherwise known as Phoenix Program, in the 4th Corps Area of Operations, which lasted from 1967 to 1972, and was designed to identify and destroy Viet Cong infrastructure by means of infiltration, torture, capture, counterterrorism, and interrogation. Winning hearts and minds wasn't the order of the day anymore. After Phoenix program was shut down, Caristo spent at least two tours with the military equipment delivery team in Cambodia, part of Nixon's military assistance program supplying the Khmer government with weapons and advisors. This is where his air delivery course comes into play. Near the end of his time in Southeast Asia, he was appointed to the Defense Attaché Office in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. His operations were officially called off in February of 1972. After over seven years of wartime service in Southeast Asia, Caristo was assigned as Special Agent in Charge of the Baltimore Criminal Investigation Division, or CID, and later as a staff member at CID headquarters. He attended two courses through the DEA in 1975, one of which was the Intelligence Analyst course. Also during this period, he became one of the Army's experts on prisoner of war issues. He was selected to serve on the Army staff for the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence. Boy, that's a mouthful. His Legion of Merit citation reads that he planned and supervised over 150 successful visits from foreign dignitaries. He directed VIP tours of the White House, Department of State, and the Department of the Interior, a far cry from running through the jungle. He retired from the Army as a lieutenant colonel in June of 1982. After his retirement, Caristo became an active advocate for refugees and prisoners of war. He would retire and live semi-quietly in Woodbridge, Virginia, with his Vietnamese wife Nhung Thi, Lieutenant Colonel Caristo passed away, aged 73. Lieutenant Colonel Caristo's decorations would include the Combat Infantry Badge, Senior Parachutist Badge, the Ranger Tab, the Distinguished Service Cross, Legion of Merit, five Bronze Star Medals, three Purple Hearts, Meritorious Service Medal, four Air Medals, Joint Service Commendation Medal, National Defense Service Medal, Vietnam Service Medal, Vietnam Cross of Gallantry with Palm, and the Vietnam Campaign Medal. He was also awarded the Vietnamese Ranger Badge and the Vietnamese Parachutist Badge, as well as his PRU and SOG Parachutist Wings. So, that was a lot to unpack. A storied life for sure. There's two takeaways, at least for me. Caristo strikes me as a professional. Always mission first. He also could recognize innocence in chaos. It's challenging to have the presence of mind to tell friend from foe in a firefight. This is very evident in his actions on that Christmas Eve raid in Cambodia in 1966. If you are a Vietnam veteran, I thank you for your service. And if you knew Lieutenant Colonel Caristo, feel free to leave a story in the comments. If you like what we're trying to do here, please like, share, subscribe, and as always, you never know who will tell your story. Live a storied life.